India's foreign policy and its, uh, uh, and its relations with the United States. Our guest, uh, the Ambassador uh, uh, Jessel, uh, has been in, the India's, in India's Foreign Service since 1976. Uh, he served uh, in Moscow, then in Washington, then returned in, in the Ministry of External Affairs, was uh, in their Department of the Americas. He then served again as political counselor in Washington during the time when the Cold War was ending and in Moscow in the period immediately thereafter. He had uh, a short period of service with re in the uh, ministry with respect to Africa, West and, and North, and again uh, in, in uh, Central Asia. Then became the official spokesperson of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, or External Affairs, uh, until I think 2001 when he became his country's ambassador to Israel. And then, Instead of going to Turkey, as he had been uh, uh, first appointed, he became the deputy chief of mission, the number two position uh, here in Washington. He brings uh, an extraordinary uh, background of uh, important positions and uh, very nice accomplishments uh, to this evening's uh, topic. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you His Excellency Raminder Singh Jessel. Thank you, Mr. Bird. Really appreciate that. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here today. It's uh, very gracious and very generous of you to accept me in place of Ambassador Sen, and I hope I don't disappoint you. Uh, maybe I'm better looking than he is, but other than that, <laughs> uh, uh, but I'm afraid <laughs> I'm really happy to be here. I have uh, been to Baltimore before, and I have attended one of the baseball games uh, between the Orioles and the New York Yankees. So it was, uh, it, it's, it's, one of the, it's one of the few games I really enjoy because it reminds me a little bit of cricket, actually. Um, well, I, uh, uh, Mr. Bird has been very generous in saying that uh, he says you can speak as long as you want and then we can have some Q&A. Now, you know, making that offer to an Indian is very risky. <laughs> We are, we are, in any case, not known to be very brief, but, uh, but what I'll do is that I'll share some thoughts with you about uh, India today and India-US relations, because both, in a way, gel and click with each other. And although there's always a temptation for people of uh, India and, to some extent, the country where I served before coming here, which is Israel, that we tend to take a very long-term perspective of things. And no matter what the subject, we like to delve deep into history and try to, uh, uh, we have a different perspective of things. So I'm not really going to go very deep into history, but I thought I should, as I was coming here, I thought I should do a little bit of reflection on why India? What is it about India that makes it a valuable partner for the United States? Where does India fit in this new globalized world, and why does it fit in that manner? Because it is in this perspective and in this context that you can then extrapolate that situation into seeing why there is a natural uh, partnership between India and the United States. There is a strategic partnership because no matter how qualified the diplomats of each country might be, how good the political leadership, but a strategic partnership doesn't get built on the basis of individual likes and dislikes, of whims of leaders, or their uh, personal feelings. It gets built if there is a convergence. And the broader the convergence, the stronger that partnership, which is why it is so encouraging that uh, the degree of convergence in the India-US relationship in, the, in our perspectives on things is such that uh, uh, a strategic partnership between India and the United States is a natural. It's a very simple proposition. There is hardly any, if at all, 
issue on which Indian and U.S. interests conflict or clash. But in fact, there is a whole range of issues and priorities and challenges before the international community in which Indian and U.S. interests actually coincide. I'll come to that a little later. But as I said, I'd like to first share a few thoughts with you about why India. Um, one answer to that is a brilliant uh, reply that one of my ministers gave when he was traveling in Hong Kong. And I was as a spokesman of, uh, I, was, I was spokesman both for the prime minister and the foreign minister. But that is when I was traveling with the foreign minister. And he was giving a speech to a distinguished gathering like this one. And they asked him a question. Why is it that India has done so well in information technology, in the IT industry? And Pat came his reply. He says, well, that's because the government had nothing to do with it. <laughs> uh, it, 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 was a, it was a remarkable answer, and remarkable answer for two reasons. One was that it obviously was a true thing, because the Indian system Many, you know, some years ago, it's, all, it's already been virtually completely overhauled. But some years ago, there was a system of what used to be called the permits and licenses and, uh, and a pretty strong bureaucratic stranglehold on creativity. And information technology was one of those branches of, uh, of uh, industry where it was, it was dependent on the creativity of the people and not permissions and licenses and permits from the government. So you had a surge in the, uh, so there was the, the reply that he gave was a very accurate response. But what it also showed to me, which is even more interesting, was the fact that a, an Indian government minister could in half jest and half seriousness actually say that in front of a public, and which would have been unthinkable, say, 10 years or so before that, that, well, we did well in that because the government had nothing to do with it. But that, is the, that was, to my mind, emblematic, reflective of a deep change that, had under, that, had, uh, that India was undergoing and that what was happening in the country. And then I, if you look at the fact that uh, uh, recently, our foreign secretary was mentioning these statistics. So um, uh, if I know what's good for me, I'm not going to contradict him. So I'm going to accept what he said. He said that there was a time a few years ago, not too long ago, when approximately 16% of the Indian economy was touched by global processes. That is, an overwhelmingly large part of the Indian, India's economy was autarkic, was, was not touched by the international process. Today, it's more than 42%. So there is hardly any aspect of India's economy and therefore India's uh, people that is not touched by international processes. So it becomes important for India to be part of this globalized world. I mean, all of us have read Tom Friedman's book, The Earth is Flat. We've read uh, uh, Edward Luce's book on uh, in spite of the gods, the strange rise of modern India. And then there's a third one, which I also saw very recently by Meera Kamdar, um, uh, her father Indian, her uh, mother American. And she traveled to India after many years and, and, and wrote a, very, a, a book which is a uh, descriptive book, but it tries to show from the perspective of a person who bridges the changes in India. When I look at this and I try to answer the question, why is it that India was able to so seamlessly find its way in this new globalized world? And, uh, and I have a few thoughts to share on that. Uh, and these are my personal uh, uh, reflections. And, uh, and I don't, uh, and perhaps uh, more serious scholars will, uh, will completely refute that. But India, for globalization for India is not new. It's been part of our tradition. The, the connection with the outside world has been part of our tradition for a very long time. For those who, have, uh, who might have studied uh, uh, some of the old Hebrew texts, we'll know that in those Hebrew texts, you will find references to the fact that to the court of King Solomon, 
there were ships that were coming from India bearing you know, spices and uh, textiles and all kinds of exotica of that time. But that apart, when the Silk Route used to traverse from China to Europe, there were two spice routes that connected from India uh, to the Silk Route, one that went through what is today Afghanistan, through the Khyber Pass, through Afghanistan, and joined up near what is uh, north of Uzbekistan. And the other route that went through the northern part of India, through Jammu and Kashmir, crossed the Karakoram Pass, and after that uh, uh, the, uh, the parts which is uh, now part of Chinese Central Asia joined that Silk Route. It was, a, it was a regularly traversed route. There were travelers who came from that route to India as well. So overland route, there was centuries old connection that India has had. I, I remember when I was traveling once to Azerbaijan, it was, uh, and, I, and I went to Baku, the capital. Just outside the capital, there's a fire temple there. It's an old, it's a place where there's a natural gas continues to burn the fire all the time. The, the Zoroastrians also see it as a holy spot. But it was a place where travelers from India used to come and stay overnight as a resting place. And in the little rooms around that uh, uh, fire temple, you will still, still today find inscriptions in Devanagari script, which is the Hindi script. And, uh, uh, and, and they are, you know, you get, you get to have a very clear archaeological evidence that frequently Indian travelers used to come to that place. If you look at the maritime routes as well, from the coast of Malabar, which is the western uh, uh, coastline of India, India has a long jutting coastline into the Indian Ocean. We have about 7,000 kilometers of a coastline. From, the, from that part, from the western part, there were ships that used to go to the Persian Gulf, to the Red Sea, to the Gulf of Aqaba, and, and there was regular commerce back and forth. Similarly, from the eastern coast uh, to Asia, it was in this, so it, it's not as if a connection with the outside world was something that was discovered much, much later. It's been there as part of a, of a very, very old tradition. Internally as well, you know, there are a lot of, uh, uh, we all have been in India since independence fighting against the caste system in India for obvious reasons. And the social revolution in India that is taking place is one through which you'll find the earlier depressed classes are getting empowered, finding a political and economic voice of their own. It's a remarkable transition that is taking place. So there have been, the caste system has had its share of uh, extremely negative influence in our society. But it also had, if you look at it dispassionately, you had in the caste system certain specialization of crafts. And one of that was business. There were castes in India the Marwaris, the Baniyas, who had, who had evolved a most extraordinarily sophisticated system of business management. I mean, it's, it's a centuries old tradition, and we had rulers who came from, we had Turkish rulers, the Mughal rulers, we had all kinds of rulers in India, but nobody touched the social framework. And this tradition with its own bookkeeping tradition has been part of India's uh, fabric for a very long time. We had, uh, uh, the other advantage we've had is the fact that India, as you know, is home to some of the major religions of the world. Hinduism, Sikhism, which is my religion, Buddhism, Jainism, these are all born in India. And to that came from our Western side, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. When Judaism came to India, around the time of the destruction of the Second Temple. And we've had a thriving Jewish community in our country ever since then. Of course, after, in the 50s and 60s, a, a huge majority of the people uh, did Aliyah and went to Israel. Uh, but they have very strong connections, spiritual, cultural connections with India. We had Christianity that came in 52 AD, when the apostle of Christ uh, uh, St. Thomas, he came to India, established seven churches in that same part in Malabar coast, which is today Kerala. And from there, Christianity spread in India. I mean, it was there well before Christianity was established in what is today Europe. We have an unbroken tradition since that time. 
Islam came to India with the traders in the seventh century and has been, has been there all the while. I mean, today we have 150, uh, approximately 150 million Muslims in our country as part of our, the mosaic of different communities. I mention this just to state that in a multi-religious, multicultural, multi-ethnic, multilingual society, it's been in India for a very long time. With the overall civilizational connection, there's a huge diversity. And therefore you find, when I look at the Indian American community here, or in other countries where I have been, the Indian American community is able to, is able to adapt itself very easily to, to peop, people from different cultures, different religions, and different languages, because it's part of the tradition that we have grown up with. I, I learned Punjabi from, as part of my mother tongue. I was schooled in English and in Hindi. And uh, so having three languages is part of a system of growing up. And the ability to not just appreciate and tolerate, because tolerating something is a very condescending kind of thing, but to celebrate diversity has been part of our lives. And of course to that I might add as an accident of history the fact that the British ruled us for a long time and left the legacy of the English language. It's one of the two official, two main link languages in my country. Hindi and English are the two languages. And since English, I believe now, is uh, used by about 25% of the population of the world, that's what I heard, it's increasingly becoming an international language. And we find that, that this accident of history gave us a certain advantage. Cumulatively, if you look at all these things, you find, along with uh, a focus and emphasis on education, you find a society that in a way is just waiting to be integrated with the global processes, is waiting to be part of the international uh, community and the international economic life. And which is why I think, and which is why we have some of the historical underpinnings of why it is that India was able to so seamlessly uh, be able to move in and integrate and uh, be able to take advantage of the global processes that are going on. It is in this context that I'd like you to see today's India, a country that is growing at about 9 to 10% every year. Of course, if we were able to bring agriculture also up to stream, which is growing at about 2.4%, if we can bring that to about 4%, the, the, the growth rate in India would go beyond that. But to an anticipate a 9 to 10 percent growth rate over the coming years and decades is, is something that is expected. It is something that is taken for granted. In fact, in our country, if in any year the growth rate is below 8 percent, I mean, the government has much to explain why it is so. It's because it's, a, it's anticipated now that a 9 to 10 percent growth rate is something that people take for granted. We have a demographic profile in which more than nearly 60% of the population of India is below the age of 25. So you have a huge, uh, uh, as some societies, the aging uh, of societies takes place, you find if there is going to be a huge human resource available to India. Of course, the challenge is to make sure that that human resource is well educated and their energies are well channelized, but that is very much there. So in the coming years and days, and of course, uh, primarily, most important of all, India is a representative democracy and has been that since 1947. Uh, One billion people democracy, it, it takes hundreds of thousands of uh, polling booths whenever we have general elections, and India's general elections are entirely electronic. Uh, there be no disputes in our electronic, uh, um, uh, in the electronic balloting system. And in fact, one of the most uh, remarkable, uh, I think what is an emblem of today's India, which is a mixture of the old and new. In the last election, we had a very telling photograph of electronic voting machines 
being carried on the backs of elephants to the more remote parts, <laughs> to the very remote part of India where there was in some remote hamlets where there are no roads. So it's an incredible combination of the old and the new. This is what is today's India, which is, uh, and, and, and now when you look at it with this backdrop, you find that a relationship with the United States is natural. United States is a multilingual, multi-religious, multicultural, federal democracy. Uh, it has opened its, uh, it's opened its land to people from different parts of the world following uh, you know, different uh, faiths and, and everything else. And it's, uh, it's brought all that creativity to itself. And India looks, uh, looks at itself backwards about 5,000 years. So in a way, you might say that uh, India is like a 5,000-year-old United States. But uh, there is an, indeed a great similarity in the two countries. The Cold War and certain things kept us apart. We all know what, what was there. But to say that nothing happened between India and the United States in the 50s, 60s, and later on, um, the 1970s was, of course, the low point when the Bangladesh war took place and, uh, and the United States, for its own geopolitical compulsions, uh, felt uh, it had to, uh, it had to uh, as this, take the so-called tilt towards uh, Pakistan. Um, that was about the low point. But right from the beginning, in fact, there are some very interesting old connections between India and the United States. As I told you, I love looking back into history. There's one very nice little, very, very nice story about a young lad called Eliyahu Yale. Uh, his family used to be in Boston. And after the, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, the Cromwell Revolution, the Calvinist Revolution uh, uh, took place in Britain, they thought that it would be good for the family to go over there and to uh, try to make money. So they uh, went back to Britain. And there, Eliyahu Yale was educated in Britain. And then he went to the East India Company in India, started at the bottom of the rung in what is called the, what is called the Madras Presidency, rose to become its governor, and then went back to Britain and as a, you know, in retirement. That's where he came to know that a college in north, uh, uh, northeast of the uh, United States was looking for funds. And that's the place where they, he used to be earlier his family came from. So he sent some trunk loads of bric-a-brac which he had brought from India, the sale proceeds of which started Yale University. <laughs> so there is a very interesting connection. There's another, a secretary, a secretary Gordon England told me this at one of the embassy dinners, that uh, the ship on the US, the HMS Minden, the ship on which the US national anthem was composed by Francis Scott, um, that ship was built in India, actually. It was, a, it was a British, uh, it was part of the British Navy, but it was built in India. And so you find some very interesting and uh, um, you know, strange historical connections and overlaps. But when I'm looking at some of the more tangible things, for example, in the 1950s, when Prime Minister Nehru was trying to lay the foundation of modern India. And one of his primary areas of interest was human resource development. In fact, that's a very amazing parallel with Israel. Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion in Israel did exactly that, which is to focus on building, on nurturing nationhood and focusing on human resource development. You have institutes like the, the Weizmann Institute, the Ben-Gurion University, the uh, Technion, and wonderful centers of learning there. And similarly in India, the Indian Institutes of Technology, Indian Institute of Science, all these were established at that time. The United States was one of the countries, the main country that collaborated with India in setting up the Indian Institute of Technologies. It was one of the most important contributions that could have taken place from this country. In the 1960s, um, and that went on further in, in later on as well, but in 1960s, when India was a food deficit country, we were 
uh, we, were, we used to import food from the United States under a PL 480 funds that were made available. And in fact, there was a little macabre joke in India that was, you know, we live from ship to mouth. Because <laughs> that was, it, it, Indian agriculture was still needed that, that burst to make, it more, to make it more productive. And that was the time when the land grant universities in the United States collaborated with us and set up institutes of agriculture and brought about the green revolution which led to food self-sufficiency in India, food security in India, and a situation where today we are net food exporters. Now that was an extraordinary part of, uh, and, and one of those scientists, Borlaug, he still, he continues to work, he's still always excited, and he's very much part of what we have now uh, inaugurated, which is a new US-India knowledge initiative on agriculture. Well, as I said in the beginning, the, to, to revolutionize agriculture is one of the top priorities in our country. To raise agricultural productivity through infrastructure development, through, a, through combining research, private enterprise, and the farmer together. So if you have the corporate world, you have uh, research from the universities, and you bring that fusion with the farmer along with uh, investment in infrastructure, there is no stopping uh, bringing about what is called a second green revolution in the country. So 50s, 60s, 70s, I came into the US-India picture in 1984, when for the first time we signed the India-US MOU on technology transfer. It was the first time that India got access to controlled US technologies. And we signed that, it was a revolutionary step. And everybody thinks that, you know, India-US relations became warm because the Soviet Union collapsed and the end of the Cold War, and it opened up an opportunity. That's only partially right. One of the big bursts in India-US ties took place at the height of the Cold War, in the 1980s, when President Reagan came to, power, uh, came, uh, came to the presidency in the United States. Mrs. Indira Gandhi was the prime minister in India. And she was very distressed by what had happened in our neighborhood by the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. And she realized that it was to the long-term detriment of our country. And she wanted to very clearly uh, in, you know, diversify her foreign policy choices and India's choices. And President Reagan was looking forward to developing a relationship with the biggest democracy. He was very impressed with that. And he wanted to see what he could do, I guess, as people say, to see how he could wean that country away from a close friendship with the Soviet Union. Well, that's what analysts and old uh, uh, released records would show. But the point is that there was a convergence. Mrs. Gandhi visited the United States in 1982, uh, after having met President Reagan at Cancun. And they decided that we have to establish a stronger foundation. And let's start with science and technology. It's something which India needs for its economy. India has centers of excellence. So does the United States. So let's collaborate. And that's how the MOU on technology transfer came about. We also started a military relationship. We, we imported uh, GE 404 engines for India's light combat aircraft. We started working in a number of, of security-related mission areas. And we set up military to military, Navy to Navy, Air Force to Air Force steering groups. We had the visits of secretaries of uh, defense, uh, Weinberger and Carlucci in quick succession with each other. And India and the United States, uh, Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi came here in 1985. And um, uh, a spectacular visit when he addressed as a young, fresh, new face, new Prime Minister of India, he addressed a joint session of the US Congress. That's, that's where I pinched that Yale story from, from his speech to the US Congress. Um, of course, he's, of course, he had another twist to it. He said, he said I wished uh, Eliyahu Yale had set up the university in India and British rule had continued here and not vice versa. <laughs> but uh, 
I, I didn't use that twist of his story. But, uh, but that story was pinched from uh, uh, Rajiv Gandhi's speech in the US, uh, to the joint session of the US Congress in 1985. So we've had, we've had a history of cooperation. What we are doing today is not new. It's not like we've pulled a rabbit out of the hat. There's a base for it. There's a foundation for it. There's an older base, which I was talking about. There's also a foundation of bilateral ties from the 50s and 60s and 80s. So it's not something new that is happening. Of course, India's nuclear weapons tests in 1998 made a small, brought about a small hiccup in the relationship. But within a month of our tests, we entered into a high-level dialogue with the United States. And two years later, President Clinton was in India, inaugurating what he called uh, a strategic partnership. And, uh, and, uh, and the statement that was issued at that time said that, started by saying that India and the United States are natural allies, and so on and so forth. So it's not that we are doing something extraordinarily new. And therefore, it should uh, uh, shake people up and say, what is happening now is an intensification. What is happening now is that the ground has been prepared for this relationship to flourish and to flower. I want to give you the last two years of what, uh, of what has been accomplished. It's across a whole spectrum of things. In April 2005, we signed an open skies agreement with the United States, first with any country allowing for totally free, unhindered access to the airspace of, for, for each other. We started in May 2005 an energy dialogue, an energy dialogue covering a whole spectrum of aspects of energy, from clean coal to oil and gas to renewables to civil nuclear. Because whether we like it or not, here's another similarity. Our energy profile and the United States energy profile is going to be nearly the same in the coming decades. Nearly 60% plus of your electricity and ours will still come from, from coal-fired uh, uh, power plants. And it's imperative for both countries, therefore, to develop clean coal, um, a process of carbon capture and sequestration, to have near, near zero emission clean coal technology. It's critical to us, it's critical to the United States. And we, have, uh, we are putting in about $11 million in this joint uh, uh, project on, on developing clean coal technology, and much more money will be required, I'm sure. We're also working on renewables and oil and gas, and, and it, it, energy is going to be critical. Of course, the difference is that our per capita kilowatt electricity consumption is about 440 a month. Yours, I believe, is about 22,000. That's the, that's the difference. So we have lots to catch up. But the profile in terms of the percentage of energy that comes from different sources is nearly the same. 60% from thermal, in our case, 25, 26% from hydropower, uh, very small percentage, 400,000 megawatts out of 130,000 from nuclear. And, uh, and then the uh, other sources that, that come to us. And we are not that well endowed in energy, uh, except in coal, and which also is very poor quality coal, with high ash and high sulfur content. So we started this energy dialogue. We also started in that same month, in May 2005, an economic dialogue. And it's not a, it's not a talk shop between government uh, and uh, government servants on both sides. It's of, that's of no use. With that economic dialogue, an integral part of that is a CEO's forum. And top CEOs from both India and the United States periodically meet to be able to give both governments their hands-on advice on how to move the economic relationship forward. And that's a critical part of the economic dialogue. In June 2005, we signed a new defense framework agreement. I would urge you to sometimes, those who are interested in this subject, to look at this, look at this document. It's there on the Indian Embassy website. It's a public document. For the first time, India and the United States have listed out their common security interests, have listed out the ways we intend to achieve them, and also has listed out the mechanism which will keep this defense relationship together. 
I mean, how we are going to uh, fulfill the, what uh, we expect to fulfill. In fact, I'll be leaving for Hawaii sometime at the end of next week for the meeting of the Indian uh, DPPG. It's called Defense Production and Procurement Group. It's a group that sees how we can improve the defense industry collaboration between the two countries. So this was done in June of 2005. In July 2005, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh visited the United States. We launched the Knowledge Initiative on Agriculture and launched the India-US Civil Nuclear Initiative, which, as you know, the Congress in December last year passed the law which um, allowed for this cooperation, which the President signed into, into law uh, on around the 18th of December last year. President Bush visited the United India in, um, uh, in March 2006. We have signed, we set up a new science and technology commission, and so on and so forth. Now, this is a record of just two years. So much has been telescoped in these two years, and that's because there was a ground for it, there was a rationale for it, a logic, and a reason for that. And it is on this basis that we have a confidence that India and US will continue to strengthen their partnership. If you look at the outside world, when the tsunami crisis, uh, when tsunami took place in the Indian Ocean region, one of the first navies, actually not one of, the first navy that was able to send out its ships, converted into hospitals and uh, uh, support carriers, were four ships of the Indian Navy. Within 48 hours, the Indian Navy was able to uh, send four ships out to help those communities which had been affected as far away as Indonesia. And we, we are very close to Indonesia in the sense that we have a, we are 60 nautical miles from Indonesia in our island territories. We have a, we have a maritime border with Indonesia. And that's how uh, wide, I mean, India's island territories, the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, are just 60 nautical miles from, from Aceh. And we sent our ships. The United States Navy joined us, and we placed our naval officers together in a, in a place in Thailand called Utapau. And from there, they coordinated support for everyone. We are working together in a very important mission in Afghanistan to support the government of President Hamid Karzai. India has given something like $750 million worth of assistance in the last two odd years to the government of President Karzai, ranging from transmission lines to hospitals to, we are building the parliament building of Afghanistan, to roads, and a whole, a whole spectrum of humanitarian assistance that supports the common purpose that India and the United States has in supporting the government and of President Karzai and to help it succeed and not to allow the, this medieval menace of the Taliban to come back to, uh, to, to haunt that place again. We have, uh, we have worked together. We worked together when there was a political crisis in Nepal, for example, when the king had abrogated the constitution and wound up democracy. We worked together. So it's been, it's been in different areas that we've found that there is a quite a natural convergence in Indian and US interests. These are some of the more recent examples. The Democracy Fund, the UN Democracy Fund was set up with equal contributions from India and the United States of, uh, I think, $10 million apiece. And we set up the, together, and other countries have joined it, and now it's, it's a reality. As I said, we are, we are both contributing to that clean coal technology. You, you name it, there is a huge spectrum of issues on which our interests, where we are working together. Would you say that we see eye to eye on everything? No, we don't. Neither, neither does the United States with many of its other close NATO allies as well. There is no situation in which all countries will see everything eye to eye. But the important thing is that the broad field of convergence grows. And there is no issue in which Indian and US interests are in conflict with each other. In science, in other areas, in space cooperation. Next year, we hope to launch two US payloads in our moon mission, which is uh, uh, to be launched from uh, Sri Harikota in the south of India. We're carrying two payloads 
uh, to scientific payloads, uh, free of cost. You know, and we have a very active uh, space collaboration that is going on. With the India-US Civil Nuclear Initiative, we look forward to the participation of US companies in India's energy development. India's problems today are an opportunity. India's problems of yesterday are an opportunity for today. It's time for us to improve our infrastructure, to improve our airports and roads, and the opportunities for the United States business and industry are immense. So we are very bullish about this relationship, and uh, uh, if there are any issues that I have missed, in my rather broad sweep presentation, I'd be happy to uh, discuss that with you, and I'll be happy to hear from you and hear your comments. I'm, I'm really uh, uh, not only, I don't intend to just answer questions, but I'd be very happy to hear comments of any kind. Please feel as unrestrained as I did in presenting uh, uh, my points. I'd like to conclude by saying that, for me, it's always a pleasure to talk of India-US relations because it's a growth industry, it's a good thing that's happening. And, uh, and, and I've spoken on this subject more than once and I try to always include something new to keep, uh, uh, to keep myself awake as well. But you know, what, what happens is that uh, uh, there's an old story about uh, uh, an ambassador who used to go from place to place and he used to give the same speech everywhere. So his driver who used to be in the background somewhere told the ambassador once, I've heard your speech so many times that actually I could give that speech without a problem. So the guy said, okay, let's try it out. So at one event, the driver spoke and, and he did a remarkable job, impeccable speech. He gave, repeated the same thing completely, top to bottom. And at the end of the speech, he said, you know, um, when somebody asked him a question, he said, well, you know, I've given the speech. now." Now, this is such a simple question. Even my driver can answer it. And, and <laughs> so, so I'm going to be here to try to answer your question in whichever capacity as an ambassador or as a driver. So please feel free to ask anything and to please comment or anything. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Um, to ask questions, you can go to the microphones. Uh, that would be preferred, or we will answer them from the, uh, take them from the floor as well. Would it be true, do you think, that the improvement, however, in England's, uh, in, in, excuse me, in India's roads and airports would lead directly uh, to, to more global warming? Um, I don't think so. The question of uh, 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 global warming uh, does relate to uh, the use of energy, the way we use it, whether it's to produce materials for uh, infrastructure development or for anything else. But the, the development of infrastructure is critical to India. Right from, I mean, if you are able to reduce the time lag within which the farmer can bring his produce into the market, there are estimates that it would automatically increase productivity by 25, 30% because so much of it gets wasted in, the, in just the farmer not having the infrastructure to be able to bring his fresh produce into the market. You improve the road, you reduce the middleman, for example, you increase his income, you increase his productivity, and you bring new things into the market. It's absolutely critical for India as a, as a force multiplier, to use a military terminology, to have improvement in India's infrastructure. Otherwise, development will become isolated pockets without it actually reaching to the people where it should. I have seen that happen. I, and I, when I was in Israel, I spent a lot of time trying to bring about the synergy between Indian Indian agriculture to learn some things from the Israeli uh, developments, for example, the management of water, the use of drip irrigation, the, the use of certain uh, materials for improving the longevity of fresh produce, etc. For us, development of infrastructure is critical. The question of global warming is very important. Uh, it has to be looked at from the context of environment as well as development. And as you know, India's uh, uh, CO2 emissions are you know, it, it's, it's hardly anything. We, 
in our case, the importance of economic development is absolutely critical. And in that context, infrastructure development is, is very important. Question As, is, what percent vote during elections? Yes, we have, uh, uh, until the last elections, our, the, uh, the average turnout in India's elections used to be between 58 and 60 percent. Between The highest was about 61, 62 percent. The lowest was 58. In the last elections, it, it, was, uh, uh, it was a little lower than what has been the average up till now. Uh, so that approximately would be the ballpark uh, figure. Now we have sometimes, from time to time, we have state elections. We recently had state elections in Punjab, state elections in Uttar Pradesh. I mean, Uttar Pradesh is uh, uh, 180 million people. It's a big state. It, uh, it sends 80 members of, to parliament out of a total of 400 plus members of parliament. 80 come from that state. It's a big state, and just about two weeks ago, it had its state elections, and of course, the the um, the, uh, the government which was in power there lost, and uh, uh, and uh, and the BSP Bahujan Samaj Party under the leadership of uh, Miss Mayawati got a complete majority. There again, we found that the turnout had dipped to nearly 50 percent, but that was a state election. But normally it has ranged between 40, 58 and 58 to 60, 61 percent. What are you doing to combat the That's brain right. drain? The, it used to be considered at one time a brain drain. We look at it now as a brain investment, even for those who have gone abroad. Uh, there are a lot of people who are going back, who are looking for, uh, because the opportunities are coming in India. I have young Indian Americans who contact us and ask us to where the opportunities lay, because um, uh, you know, they are able to connect up with the place of their origin at the same time earn good money. There's a lot of Indian investment taking place in the United States. In the last couple of years, it's to the order of about 2.5 or so billion dollars. Um, uh, there is uh, U.S. Indian investments coming here. Uh, the company Tata had uh, recently acquired Tyco and so on and so forth. There are many other such acquisitions. Mahindra is building tractors uh, in the United States. So it's going to be, in a globalized world, it's going to be back and forth movement. There is going to be, particularly in the knowledge industries, people will be, can be stationed anywhere and yet to be able to contribute. A uh, lot of uh, uh, IT companies of the world, look at the amount of investment Microsoft is making and other Fortune 500 companies that are making in India. And that's because they find the, the, uh, the, an environment where the returns are good. You have a cadre of trained people who are able to, uh, uh, to be able to give, uh, give of themselves. And therefore, we don't really look at the people outside as a brain drain. It's much more of a brain investment. And a lot of them are coming back or are contributing otherwise to the country. Uh, I don't, uh, and of course, that doesn't detract from the fact that we have to improve our economy, as I said, improve the infrastructure. You've been to Chennai and, and, uh, and, and, and Kerala. Kerala, if you landed at Cochin Airport, that's a decent airport. It's, it's a, one of the first uh, uh, public-private uh, partnerships. But in some of the airports of India, I mean, it really requires a, a huge and radical improvement. Not really improvement, they just need to be gutted and built afresh. Mm -hmm. uh, so all this has to be done, and all this will generate employment, it's going to be part of the uh, great experiment on modernization of the Indian economy. I wonder if you could care to comment on the uh, tensions, or if there are any, between the traditional social structures as embodied in the caste system mm -hmm. and the sort of rapid growth and entrepreneurial rewards of the individual that's, that's kind of modern India. Mm -hmm. How do you see that playing out? Or, or, and, uh, or, uh, are there going to be changes over the, the next couple of years, and what, what do you see happen? Uh, change is taking place all the time. The, if you look at the social revolution and how that has morphed into a political revolution as well, it happened first in Tamil Nadu, where uh, the, the DMK government came to power, and it had an anti-upper caste kind of uh, um, 
uh, you know, platform. They've been in power ever since. You look at the way the, what used to be earlier, the depressed and other classes, once they become economically empowered, they also then translate that into political power. It's happening in Uttar Pradesh, which is the biggest state of India. It's happening all over the country. So the important thing of, in a democratic structure, as we found, uh, uh, you know, is the fact that social tensions, social conflicts, get, you have elasticity in your system to be able to uh, have that revolution come about without violent means. The, the, uh, uh, the you know, you have, uh, of course we have to have certain amount of affirmative action. It's been there in India ever since, continues even today. That is only part of the answer. But the, the real answer is economic empowerment, which is why I said from the beginning, economic reforms are important, and our Prime Minister uh, continues to stress that, is to make sure that it's not only the, the guilt-edged towns with its very affluent middle class. It's going to be how it translates to the need for the, uh, the farmer out there, for example. It's, uh, it's, it's critical for us, and uh, the government is doing what it can, and also does it because you want everybody to have a stake in the reforms and not to, be, not to see it as the reform having passed them by. Challenges before our country are huge. When we became independent, 15% of India's population was literate. 85% of India's population was illiterate, did not read and write. Today, it's near 70% that India's population is literate. But still, 30% approximately translates to 300 million people. Now that is a challenge. The challenge of education, the challenge of, uh, of things like water management. These are huge challenges. But, but if you look at the starting point of 1947, where India was and what India is today, that is where the hope lies. And, and I see that dynamism in my country as, 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 well, as compared to the uh, 70s, 60s, and 70s. If you look today, there is a, there is a, uh, the, there is a certain degree of self-confidence. Sometimes it comes overarching, but uh, and and a bit misplaced. But there is a degree of self-confidence and a self-esteem of the younger, particularly amongst the youth, and and that is one of the most heartwarming uh, things to see. If you've just been to India, you'd have seen that dynamism that is taking place. Actually, I find the Indian American community here also, in terms of their educational qualifications, in terms of their median income, it's amazing how much they have accomplished in this wonderful country. The population statistics uh, out of India are just so overwhelming that it's hard to, to get a handle on it. A, a billion people in a country to manage that one state you mentioned had 180 million people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it's just incredible. And then you mentioned that the growth rate is, what, 10% mm -hmm. a year. And my question is, is that OK? Or would you like to have it lowered or increased? And medically speaking, how does it for instance, what is the, the mort child mortality rate in India? And in, answer, in answering my question about the population, is there a population control effort made in any way, or? Would you comment on your, on your population? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> I know it's, uh, it sounds uh, in terms of one billion people, but we are self-sufficient in food, for example. We have more arable land for ex than China does, for example, which has a bigger population. We have more arable land. We have still not developed the potential of our agriculture. But do we have population control? We do. There is a government effort all the time to make people more aware of uh, population, uh, uh, I mean, of uh, birth control, etc. But 
actually, that's a function of education. It, the birth control measures could be there, could be made available, but ultimately, the consciousness of keeping a family small, and it comes as part of education, it comes as part of a society in which both the mother and the father are now starting to work in a lot of places that automatically, this becomes a function of that. I'm not aware of the statistics of child mortality in India, but uh, it's, it's not uh, uh, you know, such a big problem. The bigger problem is the gender imbalance in many places. And, 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 and unfortunately, in the more wealthy parts of India, economically better off parts of India, including my part of the country, this preference for the male child has led to a gender imbalance. And then that is a problem for us. So for us, amongst the challenges I was mentioning, the education of the girl child, these are, these are huge and critical uh, problems for us. The, just the numbers is not a problem. I, if you look at the per kilometer population density, India will not be in the highest levels. I think the population density of Israel is as much as that of India. So, uh, and the population density in, in some other countries would be higher. So it's not just the numbers. The important thing is the quality of life. And to improve all indices in, in that particular domain. And the way we have to, uh, that is why the importance of making the economic reforms and development reach out to people where education and other things can change their lives. You can't do it by, you know, on, as a government, on the basis of government propaganda, you can't change society. You have to empower the people economically and politically, and that's what the economic, that's what the reform process is all about. So we are not worried about the numbers. Already the population growth rate is, uh, has gone down tremendously. It's nearly at about replenishment level now. So it's, uh, it's automatically, you'll find that that will be a function of development and education. So, well, for you. a powerful argument. Thank you. Thank you. We do thank you especially for your very strong argument about overlapping interests between the United States and India and for a thoroughly enjoyable evening, as everybody has already done. Thank, thank you, you Mr. Thank you.